Greetings. <laughs> uh, one second, one second. And uh, hello, Professor Poole. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. And yourself? Uh, very good. So, uh, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, very well, thank you. All right. So, so ladies and gentlemen, this is my very dear friend and colleague, and if he, uh, Professor Daryl Poole. He's a professor at Memphis University, and actually was a professor here at UDC a while back. Uh, he is a head of his own think tank, which I believe operates worldwide, and very kindly agreed to come to our class to talk about leadership and uh, uh -huh. some non-controversial world conflicts. And uh, uh, Daryl, just briefly, we have about 30 students here, both graduates and undergraduates, who are very much wow. interested in the topics of leadership. And to start this discussion, and Professor Poole and I have discussed it before, the first question I'll ask, and then it's all of you, so the topic is world conflicts. So, Professor Poole, in our day and age, how come there are conflicts? How come we still kill each other? That, that was a question or a statement? It was a question. <laughs> we're human. That's the answer. We're, we're simply human. Uh, you, how much do you want me to talk? About 10 minutes and then go to questions? Uh, it's up to you. It's all yours. Okay. Do they have the data I sent up to you? No, I was driving and what, the law prohibits me to forward that during <laughs> driving. <laughs> okay, okay. All righty. Well, you're, you're, you're going to get the benefit of my voice. That's, <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Let's see. You asked me to identify what the Institute sees as Daryl's top ten, if you will top 10 issues of crisis facing world leadership. Let me give you a simple statement which overarchs all 10 of the items I've put together. And it's a customized list, so you're, you, only Sergey and all of you get this customized list. I'm not going to give it to anybody else. Statement. Don't take this down. You'll get it in hard copy later. Erosion of leadership and an understanding of what that now means. Biggest single problem we see. Most people who want to lead choose this as a path to power rather than an intent to serve. This incorporates governance, ethics, transparency, direction, and will project the image of an institution no matter what you think you're doing. Consider Self-clarity and self-examination usually bypasses most modern and current leaders, yet in the past it was the hallmark of your best leaders. A capacity to serve, if you will, requires an ability to understand that decisions are A, not readily present, contrary to everything you're normally taught, B, they're absolutely essential to managing under high uncertainty, and C, it is an exposure process that very few can teach. My executive classes here, executive MBA classes, usually ask whether or not I believe leadership can be taught. My answer to them and my colleagues is no, it can't. What can be transferred, very important to understand, what can be transferred are a number of examples and precepts within which leadership can take place. The rest has to come from within the individual. Let's face it, most organizations do a great job of guiding people as to how to get promoted, but it tells them very little about what to do once they are promoted. Nothing is more certain in this than the role of the CEO. Most executives spend an entire career getting to be the CEO, king of the mountain, emperor of the world. But most executives have no idea what to do once they walk into the executive suite and close, the eye, close their doors. So that takes us, there's your preamble. Now I'm going to drop to <coughs> Daryl's top 10 reasons the world struggles in a crisis of leadership. Number 10, we're going to go in reverse order, so have fun. Number 10. People tend to have a presumption of entitlement. 
with little understandings of the requirements of what it takes to lead now. Leading now is leading through molasses wrapped in toffee. High, high, high velocity of change. Instability has become a common state. Moreover, the planet is spectacularly small and contained. People tend to strive to be in the leader's chair without any desire or sense or responsibility for what it takes to actually lead. And in order to acquire or retain and or control power, short-term expediencies, shortcuts, frequently become accepted as a legitimate objective. Leadership is almost exclusively done in terms that are longer than the current profit margin or the current crisis on your boards. Number nine, there's a series of conscious decisions. This is not good. One of them, to use fear, greed, and hatreds as specific motivations, specific objectives, and encouragement and rewards to supporters. Conscious decision to choose mediocrity as an acceptable strategic position. It isn't. Your competition will destroy you if you take that as a way in which to conduct daily affairs. Conscious decision, encourage reliance upon propaganda, a form of control through ignorance. Number eight, most leaders become concerned in short-term marketplaces with their own self-preservation. In short, either keep your job, not get fired, not get sidelined, get promoted, or get elected. If that's the current objective and it rules in about four months to two year cycles, leaves you with people not well equipped to handle catastrophe or the rising increase in what we call the black swans. A black swan, short definition. An event that no matter how improbable, if and when it occurs, the, the impact is catastrophic. Think of three years ago, the tsunami in Japan. Think of the uh, increasing rise in disastrous changes of weather. And think of our own wonderful winter. I don't know how you guys did. We lived in ice storms down here, and you guys lived in the worst of life going on in snowstorms for three and a half months. Eight, preservation of self exceeds a leader's fiduciary sense of being a chief servant to an organization. Your top leaders throughout history, in one way or another, either saw themselves or as conquerors or they saw themselves as the chief stewards to their operations. Top generals, top admirals tend to see themselves as chief stewards, the primary servant. There's a reason for corporate jets and private cars. You never stop working. Your time's too valuable and you never let off the hook. Interesting problem. Seven, deliberate abuse of communications to accelerate the accretion of power through a sequential exploitation of fear. Deliberate abuse of communications. Six, what remains of the middle class and working poor populations have developed a lowered expectation in leadership performance. This results in an increasing withdrawal from the existing political process. Whenever people withdraw from a political process, people with more radical ideas and or more ultra conservative ideas tend to rush in and there is a clash. All of your history directs into this level of clashing. The absence of self-awareness is point five. It tends to be discounted, but to, you need to understand that to manage others, you must first manage yourself. You have to determine how you choose to be known or it will be done for you. If you cannot be trusted, your competition will figure that out. 
and they will come after your customers, your clients, your suppliers, other markets, because once your CEO is seen in a perp walk, hands tied behind their back, marched out the front door, bewailing the fact that they're going to have to settle for a $35 million cash package to get out of Dodge City, well, that sends all kinds of bad signals to every one of you sitting in that room. You're fundamentally honest and could be, oh, broke soon, crushed beneath various and sundry wheels, and the perp has a uh, $35 million to retire on. So that, that doesn't work well. The key to this, understanding this, is you have to make a choice. In the future, we are returning very much back to doing business with a handshake. And we're doing that faster and faster. Most of the Institute's business has nothing to do with a contract. It has everything to do with a phone call. And it can come from anywhere between where you are to Kyrgyzstan. It is all done by trust. I emphasize the word trust. We're still on self-awareness. Just use your current lives. Just use exactly what you do now. If anyone cheats you in terms of food, fixing your house, anywhere where you have your children or the responsibility for others, they will never have another chance with your dollars. Multiply that times 14 million people at any one time in any one transaction. The rest of the world multiply it by 400 million and you begin to come close to where an erosion of trust has so damaged concepts of leadership. Always in your dealings you have to accustom yourself to speaking truth to power. Tough to do. No one likes to get beat up and thrown into the street from the 14th floor of a building. But if you're going to tell an executive that what they're doing is wrong, you have to brace yourself, have good sneakers, and bolt for the elevator as soon as you tell them they're way, way out of line. A lot of people warned Enron of what would happen. A lot of people warned um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They weren't listened to. A number of people... Daryl, something's, something's wrong with your, wrong microphone. With your microphone. Can you hear it? No, it's better. Yeah, I was making noise. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's fine. Oh. Thanks. All right. A lot of people knew what was wrong and were afraid to say anything. If you have time to correct an error, that turns out to be very easy to do. If you are living in a velocity of transactions, now, that is not easy to do. The only thing that can do that is the quality of your word. And at the end of the day, your word is what you have. Four, to lead has been confused with an assumption of a hierarchical right to rule. This creates a global misinterpretation of political objectives being financed by specific people and interests or legitimizing or engendering a right to rule. That may sound convoluted. Uh, let me try to even make that simpler. People often become leaders and feel they've been anointed by God to do whatever they want to the detriment of the society that put them in the position to lead. We confuse that constantly. Third, Income disparity and inequality is disastrous, and you are, will always be torn in some ways between making sure your business and organization survives and prospers versus what are the needs of the total society in which that business functions. Business is a creation of society. Society is not a creation of business. Why am I concerned as someone with capitalist leanings uh, about income disparity. Simple. Where we are now, no society in 4,000 years has survived the polarity. So when I say this, I'm unconcerned about a political statement. It is purely a historical observation. No society has survived it. And the governors <clears throat> on that, the length this polarity could 
exist had everything to do with life expectancy, aging, communications, technology, and the population itself. Or in short, once people start living longer, they start remembering things. If your life cycle is 35 years, as soon as it dawns on you that the current political system doesn't work, or the trade system doesn't work, uh, you have died. So, no problem. Technology, cell phones, the major issues around the world are viewed almost in real time. The technology is astonishing and it has a, self life of, a shelf life of seven months. The more we are able to use technology, the faster people are aware worldwide of what events transpire and form opinions about who did it and why it was done. Income disparity does not work at this level. Second on our hit list, there has become an increased tolerance amongst the leaders we formerly trusted for horror, brutality, wealth, misrepresentation, and human exploitation. I hear it constantly. Uh, directly uh, communicate and trust. Folks, at some point, you cannot balance this economically. At some point, you have to decide what can the human condition take. It has everything to do with business sustainability and not very much to do with poli-sci or um, uh, oh, what some people would call, what do they call it? Studies of human condition directly, cultural anthropology, it has everything to do with how sustainable is your business going to be? What does it need to do? And no organism can exist long in an unhealthy society, lives of a cell. Cancer destroys ultimately even the host. That's not necessary, but we're going to have to do things smarter. Is that a sort of a prophecy of doom? Nope. People will make considerable sums of money advance whole new organizations, create whole new enterprises because and the need for new ways is increasing. The top 10 to 20 jobs now open did not exist a decade ago. Didn't exist. All of you in this room face a um, hmm. you're likely to have 14 careers 14 different jobs. When I left school after the dinosaurs had ceased to roam the earth, just to be clear, I had three. The probability of having three was what you geared yourself for. The probability that by your third job you would be with that organization or company for life, that, that was the norm. Well, I've had seven. And at my age, Oh, that's interesting. But it's been great. It's all been based on opportunities. Some come your way. Others are thrown at you like a pie on soupy sails. Others just evolve out of whole cloth because the world is changing. And one of the top things a CEO will tell you that they face is the inability to find the talent they're going to need to run the next iteration of the company, not the current one, the next one. That's you folks. And number one, number one, number one is going to be painful, ladies and gentlemen. We have an acceptance of endemic corruption and global crime. This is deadly. Crime at this point. We have a $72 trillion global economy. $8 trillion including $4.8 trillion in shadow banking and financial manipulation, is criminal activity and it's in cash. Crime, global crime at this scale, has become the largest, single, most efficient, decentralized capitalist enterprise on earth. And it's cash. It operates on opportunity, technology, and trust. 
I said, trust? Yes. If you don't trust the people with whom you are dealing with, or they don't trust you, the consequences are very quick, very abrupt, and there are a lot of short funerals. Now, this kind of $4.8 trillion in shadow banking has stripped the liquidity out of what should be fluidly accessible global capital resources. If you could recover $4 trillion one time, you would fund health care forever. Forever. If you, could, if you could recover $2 trillion one time, you would have no further need or worry about how to clothe and shelter people. This much cash is astonishing, and it moves with great fluidity. One of our contacts, um, yeah, I, I'm going to keep this as general as possible, wound up in it inadvertently assisting uh, an enterprise that, that uh, one might you know, question how in the world they actually survive this long in the world, given what they really do. And they were prepared to invest 40, just keep that in mind, 40, in cash to change housing and provide long-term food supplies in one part of the world. And my colleague said, well, 40 million is a great start. And he was corrected. The entity was prepared to spend 40 billion out of cash, out of cash flow for several years each because they had concluded that if they did not participate in raising the standard of living in this region, within 25 years, they would have no clients, and that made no business sense. So that was, our, that was a few years back, and that was our first encounter with interests that had determined sustainability in areas of commerce you and I would not necessarily participate in, and most certainly not under uh, the current structure of American law. So there you have my top ten. Why do I think it's important? Well, let me read you a couple of interesting pure facts, and then I'm done speaking. We have conditions that create wars. The population is 7.15 billion. 900 million are in absolute poverty. Absolute poverty. That's all the time hungry. Number of countries, 196. Number of ongoing wars, 41. Number of actual conflicts, somewhere over 55. Ongoing. Add that to the three primary causes of war the Institute and Kagan have identified, famine, religion, and power. Religion is not spirituality, it is institutional. We, as um, the late Herman Kahn would have said from the Hudson Institute, we are on the edge of La Belle Epoque. So much can be done because of the advancing technologies that we will either wind up saving the planet or destroying ourselves. There is so much in this that is now pure choice. Pure choice. You all sitting there in that classroom have about, by my roughest calculations, eight times the opportunities to create change than I had 20 years ago. Eight times. The velocity of change is simply so great that the status quo will not hold. It, it won't hold more than two years under any circumstance, which means if you are living in a way that puts yourself in a matter of trust, in a position of trust, and you find that you are going to lead even though you would rather run away. I've had many days I wanted to run away. What you stand now to accomplish is extraordinary. The curious thing about it is it's profitable. 
you can do so and create wealth, but do not confuse wealth with incomes. Income is extraction of cash in the short term. Wealth takes a long time to build. They aren't the same. So you got to read your literature very, very carefully when you listen to people talk about wealth and incomes. Wealth is a long-term proposition. The great industrialists, the modern brilliant people running uh, um, or building um, technology companies don't do so in order to sell it tomorrow. Their entire intent was and is and will continue in the future to be, as Warren Buffett says, I don't buy to sell anything. I buy to own it. All of you have this opportunity. And you're going to be in the forefront, whether you like it or not, you may want to run, but you're going to be in the forefront of one of the greatest transfers of wealth ever seen, ever something on the order of two trillion will change hands as families die out. No one's ever seen anything like this and it's cash and negotiable securities and it's worldwide. Most of it will not go to people. It is going to go to institutions. We've never seen anything like this. No one has. There is no precedent for it. But there's no supply of people that can run foundations. There's no supply of nurses. There's no supply of people who know how, as a matter of stewardship, to see that institutions created by the society can indeed serve the society as a business mission. It's tough to do. But whoever figures it out, wow. Wow. And you'll do it before I'm in my grave, uh, hopefully before I'm in my, my grave. Then you have to hire me as a consultant. I would love that, by the way. Okay. I've talked too much. What time is it? Yeah, I've talked too much. Doctor? Professor Poole, thank you. So, questions. And remember, you get extra credit. <laughs> Showtime. Yes, please come up and... And speak into this thing. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay. Okay. You can sit in. Specifically right here. Oh, look at that, a person. <laughs> I do exist. Okay. <laughs> so how do you feel about the fact that people no longer stay in their jobs 20 to 30 years. And what do you think contributes to this? And is this a sign of a healthy society and a healthy business community? Well, you'll actually see some detail in the handout, <laughs> which you don't have. But let me, let me, it is a normal evolution. There is change there's always been change. What is, what is different is the accelerating rate of it. Is it healthy? Not if you use the standard set up in the 50s and the 70s and the 80s. Is it inevitable? Yes. The point for you all, this leadership class, the point for all of you sitting in a leadership class is what does it take to lead through this kind of change? How do you take care of your people? One of the things the Institute and uh, uh, certainly, well, two of the companies I served as CFO and, or exec VP for, we had to take down certain businesses. It wasn't whether or not we could keep them running. It was what and how much could we do for the employees. One, we, dis we, had dis we had to lay off a, a third of the institution. They left with A, a job in hand they were going to, B, nine months in cash, C, my board was absolutely furious with the CEO and myself for spending that much money. And we told them, if you don't like it, you go to this list of people and you take the money back. That was very interesting. 
I didn't think my boss had it in him, but he, he actually did. Warren Buffett, oh, when he buys a company or when he sells a unit, makes a point of saying it is already reduced in population, it is already streamlined, and if you attempt to strip mine this place, the sale is canceled. The asset reverts to me. He won't permit it. Even though he would make tons more short-term cash, he won't do it. There are many units that operate, many companies in the United States operate this way. They do whatever is necessary to make the unit sustainable and attractive for sale. GE was the first to actually do this with companies it was going to sell off, and that was about 30 years ago. Build it up. Enrich it. Strengthen it. It set the company or the unit simply could not be number one or two in the industry, but it was a totally profitable and contained number four. So every time GE got rid of part of its massive conglomerate, Textron did the same thing. It went for top dollar to an entity that was buying a fully sustainable and knowledgeable workforce capable of running the organization. Did it cost some short-term profit? Sure did. Did it damage the wealth where GE took back stock? Not at all. Well, Buffett, not at all. It's how you define this problem. The first is you have to have people around you who understand that this is what's happening. Technological obsolescence curve is seven months for any product on a shelf. Anybody own an iPod? A Samsung? And you're all pissed. Samsung 5 came out and your brand new Samsung 4 hit the garbage. So at least so your daughter says. <laughs> Tough problem. Great question, by the way. Thanks. I just have a follow-up to that question. So based on what you said, that companies do have to take care of their employees, do you think companies are doing enough to instill loyalty? And do you think companies are too driven about stock price and that's um, creating um, associates to not be as loyal as they would be if they were doing more for um, um, associate retention? Good question. Both are true. The United States is dominated by short-term profit and what the marketplace says. Yet the good companies in the United States don't care about that. But they're here. Reason. Yes, you can do a nice sweep and tidy up the balance sheet and get rid of a you know a old Harry or plodding along Martha. You can do all of that. Your problem, if you're a CEO and don't have a brain in your head, is you may think this is a good idea for the bottom line, but you have now sent a signal to everyone in the organization who is a high performer that they will be at any time at risk of being thrown under the bus. So you buy stock in Greyhound at that point. Folks, it's a very short-term strategy because you will erode fatally productivity. Just take your cells. If you're working for somebody and you watch them do what they need to do to get promoted and toss a few people in the rubbish bin along the way, two things occur at once. Number one, your brain says, this is not going to be me. Number two, if you have families, significant others, things that are important to you, Maslow's hierarchy of needs takes over. Food, clothing, shelter, security. You cannot and will not trust the institution. Therefore, you will work sufficiently so that the inbox is empty at the end of the day, leaving no visible reason to fire you. But in your head, you're already gone. You have already begun to look. You have already begun to study options. If I'm running this institution, the sustainability of my company, if I'm an owner, is shot. If I'm a, a CEO who intends to retire with a massive, massive cash out pension in six years, it's an acceptable risk. So what is that may not answer you, but it says you have to know a lot more about the entities for whom you choose to work. You got to read them. You got to study them then make a decision. But you also have a lot of authority over an organization 
that you join. The shop, the section, the division, you have a lot more authority than you might think. Because people will look to what do you do. And to the extent you are able to build sustainable productivity and increase it, either the institution that employs you or one that finds out you exist, and they are, they will find out you exist, will promote you. You become a rare and needed. The corporations that do this well, international paper does this very well. Just don't advertise it. Why would they advertise a competitive advantage? By telling you, this is how we run this shop. Not going to happen. Protecting people uh, in that covers a lot of different grounds. You have to, if you're in the business of the Institute, you are looking after people who are scattered around the world from time to time, including figuring out how to get them home if an area in which they function has gone hot. And that's not a money decision. That's a policy decision. Will you get them home? Will you do whatever is necessary? And the cost has nothing to do with it. Byproduct, intense loyalty. The best knowledge. People trust what we say and what we will do. Okay? He gets a bunch of points, doctor. <laughs> Thank you. Who's next? Uh, is that coming? Uh, yeah, oh, they're coming. Yeah. They are coming? <laughs> oh, so yeah, what do you? Okay, Timothy, go ahead. All right, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. All right, my question is short. Do you think the rise of B Corps is a generational response to acquiring wealth by Generation X and Y while assuring uh, social equality happens in the world? Good question. I don't have an answer for that one. There are so many things that are going to be experimental. They require much observation. So when I don't have an answer, I, I'll tell people right away, nope, Daryl the dumb here. <laughs> you know, you know. Follow my other statement about technology, the rate of advancing technologies. That's what you're dealing with. Okay. Whoever manages this, and it's going to get managed. It's going to get managed. The velocity can't be stopped. Okay. It's going to have to invent whole new ways of monitoring. KPIs, you're all familiar with KPIs, key performance indicators. What you just said does not have a KPI. If you were to create or envision one or two or even three by which the progress and application could be measured, you and Dr. Ivanov would publish a paper immediately and somebody's going to hire you real quick. Hey, oh, he smiled. Did you see the smile? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Thank you. It's the best I got for you today. All right. All right. Uh, questions? Everybody's too shy? Well, you get the final exam if you don't ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I plead on their behalf. Heath? Oh, Trinitas? Heath has a question, and then Trinitas. Okay, I have a question. Um, I, was listening, sure. I, was, I was looking at your top ten list, and as I got down to the deliberate abuse of power and communication uh, in chapter, in, um, on number seven, how does that work with government? Uh, how does it doesn't work? Yeah, I, I mean, you said it was a deliberate abuse of communication. Um, yep. Is is that does does that same does that exist in the government world? Or oh is yes, it just private industry only. No, no, no. That's that's uniform. That's right across the board. Industries, publicly traded corporations, governments, in other institutions, not for profits, NGOs. At some point, the manipulation of information you get found out. Technology is one of the things that drives that. You, we have another diff, we have a different kind of problem around this deliberate miscommunication or falsified information. The technology era, this phase of it, has created a short term or short scan process of information. Uh, Twitter. 
pick something, Facebook, messaging, 160 letters. People do not read. Well, that's the antithesis of the formation and the process by which the United States was put together. People do not read. Major issue. And after a fashion, if you don't read or you listen to a whole series of talking heads, left side or right side, doesn't matter. I'm a political independent for a lot of reasons. Both sides hated me in Washington. Folks, <laughs> if you don't read for yourself, you are already in trouble. Now, you can tell people all kinds of things. You can even repeat lies long enough for people to actually believe it. Then slowly someone sits down somewhere and says, hey, wait a minute, this makes no sense. Then the bubble sort of goes up, escalates a bit, and it gets back to whoever started the bubble, and the pattern collapses. The damage done in the mid midterm, or in the not the midterm you just took, of course, but the pattern <laughs> done in the in the short term causes a lot of damage. You can't tell what the truth is. Look at anything you see about international affairs. Try and figure out what's going on in Egypt, what's going on in the United States, what's going on in Iran, what actually is going on in China what's going on in the Crimea, very complicated situation. If you just go with the newspapers, you're going to be in a very dark place for a long time. You have to read for yourself. It's like people telling you what's in the Constitution. Do I got time to tell them a two-minute story, doctor? Yeah, please. All right. Six years ago, I'm on the mall. And I've got my little little stack of books. Actually, I've got some right in my library here. Ah, here we go. Ta-da! CDs, Constitution, Declaration of Independence, handing them out. I'm listening to people of uh, more mm, the right wing persuasion and listen to people on the left wing persuasion have a big argument about what the Constitution actually says. And I, 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 I'm sitting with my little book, I only had a couple of them at that point with me, and say, well, how is this, how does this you know, uh, 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 equate to the fact that the United States has never outlawed piracy? I thought both sides were going to string me up. Then I, you know, I said, okay, we got past that little argument. And then we got into, they got into gun control, which oh, almost had to get people to put down the signs. They're about to hit each other with signs. And I said, you know, both sides are quoting only or fighting over the first sentence of the gun control and not the second sentence. And I said, silly me, I had never learned. I said, the, sec the, ar the second ar uh, 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 article there says, in so many words, gun control, gun ownership has always been regulated in the United States. It has never been unregulated. And I had to run a block. And we you know, got people calmed down, and I took out my Constitution and read the second, a well-regulated militia, second sentence. Why did that work? Because it was driven by technology. A gun and a rifle were a gun and a rifle. No one had any remote idea of an automatic that fired cop-killing bullets. No one remotely had any idea when they created the Second Amendment. And basically, except for the new manufactured model, each side had the same basic gun. It doesn't translate well. Now, the point of all that was when I said this, people with one persuasion of the argument were incensed and said, I had a bastardized version of the Constitution. And I, I didn't know what to say. <laughs> I said, oh, I've only got this one. You know, that's not right. And that's when it came to mind that 
not only do we not read, we have no idea of the source foundational documents of the United States or why they were written. That's a problem. Now, bring this fast forward. I have an assignment for all of you. When you go home tonight, I want you to read three things carefully. One, your phone bill. Two, your cable bill. Three, your utility bill. You will not sleep tonight when you read this nightmare. Pull that out and read it and see what of your own free will you signed and paid to, paid to have happen to you. Wow. So you have to understand this is occurring in real time. It isn't something that happens a couple of years ago or a couple of months. You are always getting these little updates to your bill, yeah. changes in things. You have to read this at least once. Don't make a habit of it. You don't look like alcoholics. I don't want to be accused of having turned you into alcoholics. <laughs> but you've got to read what it is you've agreed to, and then you'll get a sense of where we are relative to business, relative to a planet, relative to commerce, not business, a construct of the late 1600s and 1700s, but commerce. It's existed for 7,000 years as far as we know. Thank you. How are we doing? Oh, good. Thank you. I uh, just have one question. Yes, uh, ma'am. I would like to know if, do you think benefits and bonus, bonuses they give to CEOs nowadays is a way to motivate leadership or not? It motivates a narrow band of leadership. It is dangerously short-sighted, and I see no economic justification for someone earning 500 times more than their own workers in current cash. Notice, I said in current cash. I don't care what you own and how many times it is. If you bought the company with the intent of building the company, staying with the company, making sure everything works for everybody, and you're, when you retire, you sell some of your hard-earned deposited stock, I have no problem with that. But if in order to be hired, they have to pay you 500 times the average worker, loyalty never enters into the equation becomes a very short-term and specific economic transaction. That's not good. And the United States right now is all by itself in this frightening disparity. And there are reasons for it, but we don't have time to get into those. A lot of reasons how this evolved. But it's not a good idea, and it's not necessary. I was perfectly happy with the company jet. <laughs> <laughs> then I had to work all the time. <laughs> get on the plane and you work. You go home and you come back and you go home and you come back and then you go to the office and you're never off. There's nothing, not, it never looks like the jet plane you see on Dallas. Oh, yeah, never looks like that. Nothing like, it's just this, car, this horrible place. It's got, it's got food in it, thank God. But anyone that has access or is required to use one will tell you in a heartbeat. You, you go early and you stay late and you work all the way. And the only benefit is you don't go through airport security. <laughs> Big benefit. I miss my airplane. <laughs> huge, huge, huge benefit. But that's it. It's a working tool. Okay. Is that, did that answer your question? Okay, questions? Okay, Simon? No? Stas? Children of Malawi. Go ahead. <laughs> I've been nominated. Okay, okay, anybody? Who is that? No, last try. That's it? Yes, come on up, Derika. Okay. You get double the points if you ask a question. No, double points. <laughs> the stampede is on. <laughs> okay. Yeah, come on in. Okay, Derek, come on up. Yeah. Uh -huh. And speak into uh, this thing. Ah, uh, my. Oh. 
Hello. Hello, ma'am. I had to ask you, what would be um, the first step to um, alleviating or even stopping the crisis in leadership? The crisis in? In leadership. Oh, in leadership. This may surprise you. I think it starts within the person. You, Gandhi, you have to be the change you want to see. The original purpose or process that set up Switzerland. A few people met in the middle of a field and agreed not to bong each other with battle axes and try and figure out what they needed to do. You want to make a change, understand that all politics is local. Thomas P., the late Thomas P. Tip O'Neill made that statement. Understand and take responsibility for who you vote for locally has nothing to do with parties. If in the United States people began to vote beyond the 34 percent level for pe the most competent person at the lo local level, but in about 16 years you have a very different political system in the United States. That not You wouldn't be communist or socialist, but people would have to demonstrate and state what it is they stood for and then deliver on that in order to stay in office, regardless of the party. We need competency. Politicians do not manage under change. Politicians are organized to extreme short-term results. The House, every two years, an election, which means anyone in the House never stops running for office and selling themselves for the money to run for office. We have evolved into that process, so I don't hold anybody liable for this, but it's no way to run a government because you, know, you cannot run a company or a business. You can't even run a beauty parlor or a salon or a hair place if you are raising money all the time because you are no you it's a total conflict with managing the enterprise in which you sit hospitals private corporations none of them run on what is effectively a 15 month cycle you get elected you go in you pay off a bunch of people to stay in your job and uh, in 15 months you are full tilt running for re-election and raising money and making promises again okay doesn't work what you do, A, you got to vote, but B, vote locally. Vote for competency, which means you got to learn a lot more about the people running for any one office than the average person now knows. And if it don't work out, next, you know, remove them at once. And in your own job, the last point, look around you at the people with whom you work and kind of determine what type of people do you want to work with and where are they and what are they doing and quietly shift to those locations where they're not beside the trailways bus shop go where you have faith go and do something you believe in regardless of what that looks like you will begin to attract to you the kinds of people that are quietly interested in change. If you want to change the world, poor Sergey's heard this, heard this a lot. If you want to change the world, save a child. People ask, what does that have to do with business? Everything. A child is a future consumer. That child's parents are consumers. That child's friends, family, extended family, neighbors, community are consumers. Worldwide, if you save a child, you will be revered by that entire collection of people. Conversely, if people believe you contributed in any way to the death of that child, that entire universe of people will hate you for three generations. So you want to make changes? Start locally. Lead by example. Save a child. I do not mean pick one up and take him to McDonald's. <laughs> talking about a very different kind of level of commitment. Does that help? Yes, that does. Okie dokie. Thank you. Okay, and the very last question. Whoever wants, again, extra points. Sharon, come on up. Oh, on we up. have... So, so, thank you for volunteering. <laughs>
<laughs> As the trundle cart brings poor Sarah down. <laughs> Yes, you got it. Who do we have? Good evening, sir. My name is Sharon. Madam. Yes. Um, in, in, a, in a world where the, the global political landscape is, is uh, so unstable and markets are just as unstable or uncertain, um, how would you recommend that a leader build, create, and, and maintain resilience um, um, in him, him or herself as well as uh, members of an organization uh, and in a way that will successfully steer an organization through crises? Mm. First, I believe you have to know who you are. The best leaders with whom I've had the privilege to meet or work with were very self-reflective. They didn't necessarily appear that way. You know, not in the sound bites and not in public. But they were deeply self-reflective. They did not pretend to be something they weren't. Most saw themselves as being in a unique set of circumstances as exactly the wrong time. What that they didn't fail, they did not harbor illusions or delusions of grandeur. If let's just talk about, about you at the very moment, right now, you are leading this class, including me and Dr. Ivanov. So Dr. Ivanov has to give you uh, double points at least. And you'd much rather be sitting way in the back or off on the right. Yes. But he here you are. The more a leader is honestly reflective, the greater the probability they will succeed. That's one. Two. You have to tell people what you believe to be true. You can be wrong based on bad information or things like that, but you have to be willing to tell everyone what you believe to be true consistently at all, all times. Trust comes from that. And with technology now, trust is destroyed when people believe you have withheld too much information or provided false information. It's a long-term premise and it must be done with great consistency. You can think of the leaders you now know around the world and you can look at some that are remarkably consistent and absolutely honest or true to what they believe and they can either be angels or total demons but the consistency remains it's a tough balance it's a very very tough balance but for the individual such as yourself it's who do you want to be and who are you oh and they also have a major a major asset the best leaders I've ever known listen in a 360 degree arc. They listen to everyone and everything before rendering an opinion, an action, and a decision. It's not so much that you may or may not agree with them. It is at the end of the day, their staffs and the people around them deeply believe that they have been heard. And if you believe someone has heard you, listened to you, and then made a different decision based on what they feel needs to be done, the worst you will feel is slightly disappointed. But right now in this day and age, if you feel decisions are made and you are shrugged off, you will not forget it and you will not forgive it. Multiply that times 40 million people. 
at any one time. Is that helpful? Very much so. Thank you, sir. All righty. Uh, we're in the end of the class, uh, so... Oh, they're going to run. Well, you can ask the question, and then we won't leave it answer it. What? <laughs> okay, you can ask the question, and then we'll, we'll, we'll leave it with a question. How about that? Unanswered okay. question. Go ahead. Hi, your last reply um, was a segue to a question of mine. And I wanted to <laughs> ask you regarding income disparity, where is the line between government policy and an individual's personal responsibility to enhance themselves? Oh, it's a great question. Government policy has become drastically short-term and not capable of resolving problems. Therefore, the individual has a tremendous personal responsibility. Absolutely tremendous. It's the closest answer I can actually give you. If you look to government, you are looking for something that cannot happen. Not in the short term. Thank you. So, short-term steps must belong to the individual, but you have to support them. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Professor Poole, thank you very much. Uh, let's you give all. Uh, professors a round of applause. Yay! Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and next time I know you'll be presenting in person. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Professor oh, Poole. Thank goodbye. you. Bye-bye so now. Oh, thanks. Bye-bye.